Cruiser Slicer 2.6 is finally here in full public release. So if you haven't updated yet, get that done. There are a lot of changes and it really does change the game for slicing as we know it. Let's talk about it. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. We're gonna be looking all at the brand new Prusa Slicer 2.6, which is now in release candidate, which is RC2 that we're looking at. And of course, if you wanna download it, links will be in that description. If you've been holding off on trying it because well, alphas and betas can be a little bit buggy, the RC is the right time to try it. And hey, who knows? By the time this video comes out, it might actually be already public. So keep an eye out on the description if you're looking to download it. But a lot has changed and not a lot of it's the UI. We've got 2.5.2 here, then there's 2.6 looks basically the same to me, which is good. That's the kind of stuff that we want to see. It's just adding new features. And there are a lot of them. On the list, we've got dynamic overhang speed, automatic support for your FDM parts. You've got cut tools now with pins, as well as the ability to emboss. There's also a new measurement tool. And of course, you can't forget Prusa's implementation of tree supports, which they are calling organic supports. I'm still waiting to see what the free range supports look like. Together, all of these fixes really, really build to a beautiful system that looks a lot different than the 2.5 that we've been used to previously. Let's take a look at some of those features. So one of the big ones right off the bat is gonna be your dynamic overhang speed. That you can find underneath the speed settings. Now it will only be available under the expert tab and then you will get it available. What that enables you to do is based on the percentage of overhang, adjust the speed of the printer. So if you want to run really fast speeds, maybe if you're running a Mark IV with the new input shaping beta that's available, but you want to make sure that you slow down when you're doing relatively large overhangs, hey, it's right there. All of this is tunable. And hey, if you don't want it, just turn it off. That is not present in the 2.5 at all. In fact, there is no option for it, period. But one of the big things that we saw in 2.5 was the advent of support painting. But if you have a pretty complicated model, support painting can be a bit of a pain. Like this Optimus Primal head from Paramount Studios, this is gonna be a real pain to support. And in 2.5.2, you kinda gotta set your overhang distance and well, start painting. And on a model like this, you're going to end up with a lot of extra support material where you don't necessarily need it. But in 2.6, that same model, all we have to do, set our angle and then click automatic painting. Now, I'm not certain if the angle itself matters for automatic painting, but automatic painting does all of the hard work for you. Automatic painting has identified areas where the overhangs are going to be a problem for the printer. You can, of course, go back paint on more as you see needed. But if you are just starting out, clicking that automatic painting button is a great way to get pretty darn close to what you need without just saying, I want supports everywhere. Inside, we will go ahead and select and start with snug supports. Let's get ourselves some numbers here. Utilizing snug supports on a model like this might actually result in a better time, but what it's not going to do is result in an easier to clean up part. Utilizing the brand new organic supports, or as a lot of you are aware, would be called tree supports. While it does add a little bit of material and a little bit of time to the part, this will be much easier to clean up. Now, in some cases, going over to organic supports will save you hours and quite a bit of material use. Your mileage may vary, but on a model like this with the automatic painting enabled, the organic supports themselves aren't realistically doing the best job they can at reducing your print time and material use. And it's because that it connects all the little branches. You ever had a part where you've used snug supports or the regular grid supports, and there's just a little bit of support stuck in a place that you can't get it out, and it just drives you bonkers? Organic supports pretty much put that to an end. When we look at this on something like grid, yeah, you've got better towers, but it's a lot more material usage and a lot more time. And while yes, snug would be a less material and less time, I do believe that organic supports would give you a pretty good system here. But a model like this isn't exactly designed for FDM printing. If we look at trying to put it on a flat surface, you don't really have one. That's a bit of a pain. 
So you might decide that cutting the model makes a lot more sense. And in this case, I probably would. So we can grab the cut tool and this looks way different than what you're used to. Not only can you just slowly go up through it and it shows you a cross section, but if you want to, you can angle it and then angle it and cut it in any direction that you may want. Now for me, we're just gonna go with a normal angle just like this and I think that'll be okay. But we can also now add connectors. Connectors are a wonderful way for you to take parts that you would normally just have to kind of align and glue together on your own and actually get them to click in place. We can see that you've got some options where you can do a plug or a dowel. Me personally, I like the dowel where the pins themselves print separately and then you utilize them. Now, if you're a real trick, you can make your dowels about 1.8, 1.85 millimeter and just use some filament, but it is nice to be able to print them. Personally, I prefer the square or the hexagon. And the reason that I prefer it is it helps with keying of parts that might have a tendency to rotate, especially if you're only using one or two. But all we have to do is find the surface, click on it, and it will go ahead and add those pieces for us. We can change the depth and we can change the actual tolerance. So if your machine needs a little bit more tolerance, it's a very easy thing to do. But make sure that you change those tolerance numbers before you add the pins, because when you make changes, it only changes the ones after it. So something to note there. You also have your depth and your size. So if you want larger ones or you want them to go deeper into the model, all of that becomes a viable option. If for some reason your pin would create a problem, it's going to warn you. So if your pin is too long and gonna stick out, it will tell you invalid connectors detected. One connector is out of the object. And it's this one right here. We can move it back into place and life will be good. Now, don't need it to be that tall. So we'll go there. So once we have our connectors, We'll do that and we're left with our model once again and you are also able to then place it on the cut itself let's do our cut from there we can see our object that is oriented and ready to print in this orientation we're going to deal with significantly less support and because you can modify the angle at which you do those cuts you can put them however it makes the most sense and if you're someone that loves to print figurines especially on fdm this will be great for being able to cut the arms off right at the armpit and then cut them off somewhere else so you can get the detail in the fingers but still get the strength in that connection itself if you want use a circle that will still give you the range of motion in that joint. And of course the pins are then individually placed for you. So you are then able to place them however you want. Now, personally, I'd like to see the pins laid down, especially if they're square pins, because putting them vertically is not designed for strength. You, you'd want to lay those down, but you know, now that you have your models cut, you might want to make some more modifications. And Prusa Slicer has done something that is so difficult to do in CAD, especially if you work with a pretty interesting model like this. Embossing text would be an absolute nightmare to do in CAD. In Prusa Slicer, simple as right clicking, adding part, going to text, and then choosing whatever font you want. And this works with any font on your computer. You can then go into the advanced tab and click use surface. And at that point, it will emboss the text right on the surface of the model. And you might say, well, Grant, that's not embossed on the model. And well, technically it is. If you go under the advanced and say use surface, now that text is projecting directly off of that surface. Which, if you're someone that likes to label your parts or make some extra customizations, let's say it's a trophy for a loved one or not a loved one, all of these features are available and whatever font you want. You have control of your height and your depth. And of course, it can be an emboss or a deboss, should you prefer it. Let's say you want to make sure that you get something the right size and it's not as much as the exterior dimensions we can see here on the maker viking calibration cube all i can really see are the x y and z measurements but let's say we want the tips of the horns to be a specific distance apart we're going to do our best to grab a point toward the top and we can see it's about 20.463 but i want that to be 15. no problem scaled now the entire model is scaled so the points of the horns themselves are exactly 15 millimeters apart. If you're looking to scale objects, this is a great way to do it. So you know that everything is exactly the way that you need it. But do not use this to calibrate your printers. These models are specific sizes for a reason. Leave them that way. Now that you got your scale, 
it's time to actually look at slicing this. And one thing you might not immediately notice, but will become incredibly evident if you print with a very small amount of sparse infill will be the extended layer that goes between your sparse infill and what would be a solid layer. This is what it looks like in 2.5 for the top of the Maker Viking Cube. In 2.6, we can see that it is much larger, and that is to accommodate and make sure that every area is dealt with. This does cover it as well, but we can see it's not connected to the outer walls. On top of the improvements for, you know, the bottom of your sparse infill, we've got major improvements when it comes to dealing with infill and solid layers. That whole inshore vertical shell thickness has been heavily improved. This is the exact same layer in Prusa Slicer 2.5. And we can see, uh, it doesn't look great. In 2.6, we have all the infill and we're ensuring our shell thickness without adding too much extra BS infill. These settings are identical. This improvement for vertical shell thickness is huge when it comes to print time. We can see that we're at 186 grams of usage and a 20 and a half hour print. In 2.5, the same settings, the same settings is 209 grams and 23 and a half hours, actually a little bit above that. So you're saving a ton of time and material. But if you notice, there's one little difference here. We've got a warning to let us know that there's some issues that we're going to have with printability. Not just with these dowel connectors that are so small they're likely going to pop off the bill plate, but also all of this material that's unsupported. It's telling us all of this that there's some stuff that we need to deal with. We've got floating bridge anchors, collapsing overhang, as well as low bed adhesion detected. This is a brand new feature in 2.6 that really adds to the user friendliness, especially for the newbies. Those of us that have been doing this for a long time, yeah, we might make a mistake here or there that this might catch, but this is huge if you are new to the game and don't have a ton of experience running these programs. It's a good check for us old timers as well. And credit where it is due. One of these new changes, which is dealing with conflict detection for toolpaths, is ported directly from Bamboo Studio. This is the brilliance around open source and why we as a community really need to support it. Tom Sandlatterer actually did a great video recently on the death of open source. We'll link it in the description so you guys can take a look. I believe he's got a lot of great points and I, I don't, I'm not proud of them. There's now a system to check for colliding toolpaths after slicing. In the example here, we can see that the part that is printing actually collides with the support. Now, in some cases, you might find this to be intentional or not. And if it's not intentional, hey, the program will let you know ahead of time. I am really enjoying 2.6 and I think you will too. The power of open source means that some of your favorite slicers out there, whether it is Bamboo Studio, Super Slicer, Orca Slicer, which I need to take a look at. Let me know what you guys want me to take a look at inside of Orca in those comments below. It is one that a lot of people seem to like and one that I haven't spent any time in yet as I've been battling with more problems with my Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon. I am enjoying what Prusa is doing with Prusa Slicer. It shows that for a hardware company, they got one hell of a software arm as well that is dedicated to making open source part of their bloodline as a company. I'd love to know your thoughts as to open source and its value. I think that when we have companies like Prusa doing all of these changes and companies that are able to share and work back with Prusa, it's an amazing thing. I will say one thing that I would love to see, Prusa, please, please do this. The build plate management from Bamboo Studio, I would love to have that in Prusa Slicer. It is one of the favorite things that we have in Bamboo Studio because it just makes organizing your prints so much easier on separate build plates rather than having to just have them all stacked off to the side and slide them in as you need them. I know that it does organize them as build plates if you just auto orient everything and auto arrange everything, but I can't just click on that specific set of parts and slice those parts. So it'd be really cool if we could see that come in. I'd love to know what else you guys would love to see in Prusa Slicer 2.6 and any of the further releases of it. If things go the way this goes, 3.0 is gonna be coming up in the next year or so. And 
if these are the kind of changes that we see from an incremental 2.5.2 to 2.6, boy, howdy, the changes that we might see when we go from whatever the successor to 2.6 is to 3.0, would be absolutely astounding. The ability for us to start doing legitimate CAD work inside of the slicer itself seems to be on the horizon with the measurement tools, the cut tools, the embossing tools. These are all things that we're used to having inside of CAD, but this isn't CAD, it's a slicer. And if we could start integrating that in, maybe it's Prusa CAD or Orange CAD or I don't know, pick your poison for names. That would be amazing for us to see because that starts to democratize the design side, which as it currently stands, outside of something like Tinkercad, which is a great program, it's limited. There's not a lot of CAD out there for beginners. And if you really wanna stay open source, FreeCAD? FreeCAD is the one software that I tried on a live stream and Rage quit so bad, I never went back to it and we actually deleted the live stream. It does not exist. FreeCAD is a much different ecosystem. And while it is fully open source, there are some downsides to it. It's not the most user friendly. Now I know it's gotten better, but maybe it is time for me to give it another chance. Seeing some of those features inside of Precisor to me would be amazing. And I'd love to know your thoughts about it. But that is all that I have for you guys today. Let me know what you think of Precisor 2.6 in those comments below, of course, download links in the description. And hey, don't forget to check out our first look at 2.6 when it was back in the alphas. We'll link to that in the description below as well. That's all we have for you guys today. Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. And a massive thank you goes out to all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube channel member supporters whose names are listed right next to me at the $5 tier and higher. Thank you for what you all do in making these videos possible. Remember, if you do want to support the channel financially, you can do so for as little as $1 a month. Links are in that description down below. Right below me will be our first look at Precisor 2.6, where it was still in the alpha stage. Some things were a little bit wonky, but it was still a great first look. And you can see that a lot of those features have just been made better between then and now, right next to that will be our slicer playlist so you can see my attempt to look at other slicers and kind of understand why we've chosen Prusa Slicer as the main slicer. Although, uh, Orca Slicer seems to be pretty nice. Stay tuned. That's coming soon. I'll see you guys in those comments and the next one. Take care.